Um, let me introduce myself, if you haven't met me before. I'm Hendrik Sprout, the director of the Buffett Center. Uh, welcome to all of you for the Chenamin 20th year retrospective and anniversary. I would uh, particularly like to thank uh, our participants of the uh, workshop this afternoon, and uh, particularly our keynote speaker, Mr. Wang Dan. Before we start, I'd like to uh, thank some individuals of different departments and schools who've made this event possible. Uh, first, I'd like to thank Victor Schur of the Department of Political Science and Pete Carroll, who I saw two seconds ago, of the History Department. Uh, both of them being instrumental in their organizational efforts and pulling this together, so thank you both. I'd also like to thank Holly Clayson of the Alice Kaplan Institute, Tim Breen and the Center for Historical Studies, Dean Sarah Pritchard of the Northwestern University Library, and the Asian and Middle East Studies Program for the support of this symposium. Northwestern University Library is also hosting various documentaries and exhibits that pertain to the Tiananmen events. The efforts of Mr. And Mrs. Chun uh, Jing Li, sorry for the first name pronunciation, I'm working on it. Uh, she gives me the sort of okay, but I appreciate that. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Lucy Lyons and Mr. Tom O'Connell have been critical in putting these exhibits and documentaries together, uh, and I thank them for those efforts. Uh, I'd also like you to, uh, to look at the um, uh, flyers if you haven't seen them yet. Uh, the right side here lists a variety of things that are going on this week in the library and will continue to go on till June 4th, the actual day of, of the uh, Chinaman Massacre. And it's also on the back of the short, uh, uh, smaller uh, flyer if you haven't seen that either. Um, and finally, uh, I would like to thank, of course, uh, the uh, Buffett Center superlative staff. Christophe, who you've seen running around, uh, Christophe has been critical in, in organizing this, as well as Rita Corian. Megan Beltman has also been helping out. And thanks to, uh, once again, my staff, who's second to none. Apologies to fellow chairs and, and other directors. What about today's events? Um, I think it's fair to say that uh, Tiananmen constituted a watershed event. Just as Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union were moving away from authoritarianism and communism, Tiananmen signaled how China was moving in an opposite direction, culminating in a dramatic and brutal setback of democratic aspirations. It is also fair to say that the events of 20 years ago continue to resonate today. Tiananmen remains a taboo subject for discussion in China, with recent crackdowns reminding us that authoritarian government maintains its grip on Chinese society today. By the way, there was an interesting piece that just came out of the Chronicle of Higher Education looking at Tiananmen Square and the events of 20 years ago, uh, perhaps worth looking into if you're interested. So it is a taboo subject in discussions in China, and it is even, I would say, taboo to some extent in the United States with some of our universities issuing this topic out of fear to upset sensitivities in the Chinese government. Now, we at the Buffett Center believe that the Tiananmen protests and the legacy of its repression are too important to ignore. If national identity is constructed through a process of collective remembering and collective forgetting, as the French scholar Ernest Renan reminds us, then surely how Tiananmen is remembered or how it is collectively forgotten will play a critical role in determining China's future. So on that note, I'm honored to introduce Mr. Wang Dan. Mr. Wang Dan was a key student leader during the protest of 1989. Indeed, he made the top 21 list of most wanted leaders, and in fact was designated number one on that most wanted list. He was apprehended in 1990, spent four years in jail, was then released and arrested again in 1995. In 1997, he was given a medical leave to go to the United States, uh, and subsequently at Harvard University, he gained his postdoctoral, uh, his, his PhD uh, at Harvard, and subsequently went on to his postdoc fellow at Oxford University, where he is currently. He remains interested in democratic reform, and in that capacity, is chairman of the Chinese Constitutional Reform Association. So, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Mr. Wang Dan, Dr. Wang Dan, to my class. Thank you. 
Thank you for host uh, to give this chance to talk here. Um, it's, I think it's very meaningful to talk about Dreamforce. Now, it's not only because this is the 20th anniversary of Dreamforce, but also because uh, the year of night is always very important for the history of the Republic of China. We, we, we say 1949 is the establishment of the People's Republic of China, and 1959 is uprising of Tibet, I think. 1969, I don't know. 1960, I was born in 1969, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and 1979, we saw the real start of the, the, the reform and the opening. And 1989 is the topic of today. And 1999, we saw the incident of Falun Gong. So we can see, so 2009 is also will be very important, I think. For, for, the, for China. And uh, it has been 20 years since June 4th, 1989. Regardless of whether people in China do not dare, do not dare to re mention this event for fear of a political repression, or they really have simply forgotten about what happened in 1989, it's obvious that few people in China choose to consciously remember what happened on June 4th that year. So I'm very glad that I have this chance here to talk about June 4th. Today, I will speak on three topics. First and most importantly, are my thoughts about June 4th. The second, I would like to share with you my opinions about the situation in China today related to my review of June 4th. And finally, in the last part of my talk, I would like to talk about how to realize China from Western perspective and how Western world can help China regarding our political progress. My first question is, looking back to 1989, what I think we need to remember related to today's China? Discussions about the reasons behind the process of the movement and the significance of the whole 1989 democratic movement have never ceased during the past 20 years. I think that one problem in these discussions is that there has been insufficient analysis of these events against the background of the social development after June 4th. Especially the characteristics of the transition in China since Deng Xiaoping's trip to southern China in 1992. This shortcoming limited studies and analysis of June 4th to the framework of only 1989 that year and the student movement, this is really unfortunate. So here I would like to, I would like to provide three point of views about the event that I hope will relate the movement to the social transition in the 1990s. First, nowadays the rethinking about June 4th, I think put more emphasis on the demand for democracy. Well, well, ignoring another important demand of the time, that is, demand to eradicate corruption. In fact, one of the basic reasons why we students and the intellectuals raised the issue of democracy was because we thought that the only way to eliminate corruption would be through the establishment of a democratic institutions. Since June 4th and up to this very day, it's very obvious that the corruption has become worse and worse and is currently the greatest obstacle in China to further development. I think that one of the reasons for the rampant institutional corruption that exists today is the violent crackdown of the, on the demand to whip out corruption 
in 1989. This is because in the aftermath of June 4th, the Communist Party refused to embark on any political reform. As a result, it has been impossible to establish anti-corruption institutions and any movement to eliminate corruption has remained limited to within the establishment. So all activities and suggestions for anti-corruption which come from outside the establishment are regarded as a challenge to the party's authority. In addition, because the students' demand against corruption were suppressed, pressures from the civil society have diminished because of a fear of a political terror. The people's passion toward politics and the avoidance of political participation throughout the 1990s can be seen as expressions of such fears. Thus, we can see, I would say, the crackdown on June 4th, not only, as not only a victory of authoritarianism, but also a victory for corruption. Second, it has been said that students' demands were largely fulfilled during the reform in the aftermath of June 4th especially after Deng Xiaoping's trip to southern China in 1992. People who take this line can claim that the Chinese Communist Party has already learned its lessons from June 4th. But I think that direction, I think that the direction of the reform in the 1980s is not that which the student demanded in 1989. Even though on the surface, it appears that the students' demand for further economic reform largely satisfied by Deng Xiaoping's talk in 1992. But in reality, the fact is that because of the crackdown of so-called liberal thought and the establishment of a market economy are actually developing without the participation of a people's power and in the absence of oversight by the people. Thus, the underlying purpose of Deng Xiaoping's trip to southern China and the CCP's pro promotion of a further economic reform are only to strengthen the political power of the Communist Party and to maintain internal unity within the party. And the cost for this is being paid, being paid by the people. In actuality, since 1992, there really has not been any political reform because the authorities have no longer been interested in or willing to establish a democratic China. The reform has been transformed into a license to openly steal the people's property. Therefore, I think that since 1992, the reform has basically died. Instead, that we see today, what we see today is a process whereby one group is collectively benefiting from the dividing up of the people's property. Now, this has produced serious social injustices regional inequalities, and the growing rich, poor, and urban rural gaps. These are all issues that we were concerned about in 1989. I still remember in 1989, at that time, some people pointed out that market economy reforms without the establishment of democratic institutions will ultimately be transformed into a process of dividing up benefits. This is the reason why we appealed for democracy in 1989. Therefore, we can see that China today is taking a development, development path based on social injustices, 
because the CCP did not learn the lessons of June 4th. Third, it has also been argued that it was June 4th itself that caused the CCP to cash out its plans for reform, including the plans for political reform. And June 4th can be blamed for halting progress with respect to reforms. These people argue that the students in 1989 had good intentions, but the result of their good intention had negative effects. But I think this is just conjecture, lacking in any historical evidence. In fact, it was not the 1989 student movement that cut short the process of reforms. The truth is that the demand for further reform scared the leaders of CCP, and then it ended up resorting to bloody military means to stop it. Basically, compared to the democratic movement, both in East Europe or in Taiwan, the democratic movement in China did not raise any radical demands. When the students embarked on their hunger strike, they had only two conditions. One was that the government should amend the April 26 editorial and not refer to the student movement as a turmoil. Is this a radical demand? The second condition was to open up a public dialogue between uh, the public dialogue with officials to discuss the reform. Can anyone see this is a radical demand? When, when we were planning the hunger strike, I still remember I suggested that we needed to add a third condition. That was, we should ask He Dongcheng who at that time was the Minister of the State Education Commission to step down. But my suggestion was rejected by other student leaders, including Chai Ling, because they thought that we should not push the government too far. So from my experience, I know that the students were being both rational and moderate. If there really were some reform factions within the CCP that had plans for further political reform, the students' actions undoubtedly could provide them with a good opportunity and a strong support. If the authorities had accepted the demand of the student and had been willing to engage in a dialogue with the society, thereby promoting political reform, then a rational reform process could have been already undertaken. How did it happen that the CCP could call this a big turmoil? So the responsibility for what occurred should be placed entirely on the shoulder of the Chinese government. It was the government that refused to accept a golden opportunity. And then the reform was halted. Those who claim it was the students' actions that brought an end to the plans of the reform factions within the CCP, I think they, are, they have a very one-sided opinion about the internal reform of the party. In 1989, we put all hopes on Zhao Ziyang. And after 1992, Chinese people put their hopes on Zhu Rongji. And now they put hopes on Hu Jintao and Wen Jiabao. Maybe we will have Xi Jinping and Li Keqiang. But what has happened? I'm sorry to say that these people were disappointed over and over. There was never any student movement or any other social protest to upset any plan by former Premier Zhu Rongji. But still, did he ever do anything for political reform. Now we can see what has happened in Hong Kong today. Hong Kong is a society 
with a very stable social situation and a large media class. So why does the Chinese government refuse to allow general elections even in 2007? So obviously, the blame for this cannot be placed on the student. Well, I know that it's not up to us to decide when there will be a reassessment of the 1989 event. Only CCP has the power to overrule its position on June 4th. But, but there is there's still one thing we can do, that is to protect the histor historical truth. That's my first question. And the second question is, what's the relationship between 1989 and the 2009? Based on my rethinking about June 4th and looking forward to present day China, I also have three points of view to share with you. First, the basic social crisis which led to June 4th has never been resolved and it continues to simmer and seize beneath the surface. 1989 provided the best opportunity in Chinese history for state and society to operate together to bring about a peaceful political reform. But unfortunately, the Chinese Communist Party lost its chance to seize this opportunity. After the event of June 4th, the focus on the reform, shifting from political and economic reform to addresses only economic issues. So there will be a heavy cost to the unbalanced development between political and economic reforms that will be paid by future generations. In this respect, I think the 1989 movement and its influences is still an ongoing process in China. Second, we all realize that there has been rapid economic growth in China. And as a distant, I personally highly prize the achievement of the Chinese government to promote economic reforms. But still, I do not think that there's any way that Deng Xiaoping can be forgiven for the crime of crackdown on the peaceful and nonviolent movement. But at the same time, his contribution to economic growth also cannot be ignored. But only economic growth without political change, I think is insufficient. 100 years ago, when Max Weber analyzed the development of Germany, he pointed out that a backward nation that experienced sudden economic growth will face serious dangers if the political system does not mature in conjunction with the economic system. The development of Germany in the following 50 years confirmed Max Weber's predictions. Similarly, the future of China with its high speed economic growth, but without a modern political system, is not necessarily optimistic. Third, when we face all the splendor of modern, of modern day China, we cannot ignore the fact that beneath the prosperity, we should remember that just like New York is not United States, Shanghai is not China. I still remember in 2005, a Peking University professor, Ding Yuan Zhu, conducted a research about the prospect for China's future over the medium term. I was quite surprised to see the result of his work. That is, among the 77 experts and scholars 
whom Professor Dean surveyed. 51 of them, 51 of 77, expect that a large social crisis will erupt on the mainland before the, two, before the year 2012. We have three years left. The people whom Professor Dean surveyed are not distant, or even not critical intellectuals. Rather, they are scholars and experts working within the establishment, working within the government. I think that if some of you may feel that the, their opinion carry more weight than my opinion, if there's a case, that's, if that's a case, this survey can lead to only one conclusion. That is, economic reform alone without accompanying political reform will not ensure the future stability of China. So not only does China need political reform, but China must have political reforms. And I think if there's to be political reform, it should be begin from a reassessment of June 4th. <coughs> the third and the last question is, 20 years past, how should the Western countries realize China? With the coming of a 20th anniversary of Tiananmen Massacre and the 60th anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic of China, the already heated discussions about China in this world can be expected to reach a new height. We believe that a new perspective is needed very much at this time. We are openly acknowledging the impressive economic development of the so-called Chinese miracle. One must remember that the basis for this so-called miracle still rest on a market economy under a one-party system. Under the Chinese one-party system, the Communist Party suppresses public opinions and imposes its policies regardless of the interest of the common people. Without powerful counteracting forces from the public, this party can easily enforce its policies and suppress any resistance from the civil society. The party has nipped in the bud any element it deems having the potential to threaten stability. Furthermore, it imposes strict controls over economic activities, thus attracting large amount of foreign investment and reducing the negative influence, impacts of international economic changes. Under this one-party system, where political domain remains a forbidden zone, people have focused their energy only on economic activities, therefore providing an engine for the rapid development. But in the absence of morality, and with an unprecedented, unprecedented unleashing of material desires and greed, the resultant economic boom, in effect, I think, is a very unhealthy economic growth. The one-party system has given rise to rampant opportunities among the party officials who have taken advantage of the reforms by seizing state-owned property to lend their own pocket. Party secretaries, becoming instant capitalists overnight, have used their political power to accumulate a huge sum of money and to profit from the economic profit of enterprises. Over the short term, such phenomena may be beneficial in bringing about a rapid privatization of state-owned enterprises, thus boosting the overall economic development of the country. And this is the secret of 
the present day so called Chinese miracle. Contrary to most expectations, the Chinese reforms and the subsequent economic growth have not led to liberty and democracy. In fact, the success of the reforms has become the best excuse for the communist regime to reject freedom and democracy. Former leaders Deng Xiaoping and Jiang Zemin and the current president and general secretary Hu Jintao, they all they have all used economic development as both the reason and the justification for suppressing the peaceful democratic movement of June of 1989 and for maintaining the one-party system. For Chinese leaders, privatization is not intended to provide a foundation for democracy, but rather merely to allow a small number of elite to appropriate state property. Such privatization may indeed be more rapid than privatization that involves democratic participation. But this privatization is not for the benefit of the majority. As a result, despite some government efforts to implement measures to improve the situation of disadvantaged groups, social conflict are intensifying. The Communist Party regime only wants to cover the severity of the conflict so as to continue to achieve so-called sustainable exploitation through controlled oppression. Therefore, instead of the reforms bring democracy, the pro-democracy forces of the whole world are now witnessing a growing totalitarian regime that is both complacent and dictatorial. The next few decades will be a crucial period, not only for China, but for the rest of the world as well. If China does not change its current track to move instead in the direction of democracy and liberty, a tremendous disaster might befall the whole world. Never has an economic giant without a democratic political system been capable of achieving a glorious record in history. Germany and Japan before World War II were two most recent examples. So then what Western countries can do to help China? Nowadays, some Western leaders called June Falls, a sign of another era. Is this correct? I think certainly not. Today, many participants in the June Falls democracy movement are forced into exile overseas and banned by the Chinese government from returning to their own country. My own story, my own story is, again, one example. After my Chinese passport expired, the Chinese embassy refused to extend it. This deprived deprive me the right to be a Chinese citizen simply because I participated in the 1989 movement. The Chinese government has never eased its persecution of those of us who were crushed by its troops in June 1989. Today, the government still prohibits anyone from publicly mourning those who killed on June 4th, especially including those parents who lost their son or daughter, who we now called Tiananmen mothers. What evidence do we have for seeing that the conditions of human rights has been improved? I understand the importance of engaging China. I believe that keeping trade relations with China, ordinary Chinese people can benefit. 
but only focus on economic relationship does nothing to the development of Chinese civil society or raising the standard of living of average Chinese people. At the end of last year, we saw hundreds of intellectuals send chapter 08, simply appeal for very basic human rights that they think Chinese people deserve to have. This is a very clear signal to show that because a strong totalitarian, totalitarian regime, in China, we will witness a new social forces, which we call civil society. And that is the hope for the future of China. I suggested that Western countries, including Americans, should put more attention on the growing civil society. And the reason is very simple. Because I think to deal with Chinese government is to deal with the China of today. But to deal with growing civil society is to deal with the China of tomorrow. The construction of a mature and a powerful civil society is very critical to China's social development and democratic progress. Its significance is that it will not only train people's democratic consciousness during the construction of a civil society, and so promote the re realization of democracy, but also set a sound foundation, set a sound foundation to stabilize the democratic system in the future. So that the democracy process will not, will not backward. So where the Western government continues to deal with Chinese authorities, they should not lose sight of those potential leading forces that are giving rise to a civil society. Then the final question is, how can international societies to help China's civil society? I think that the international society can help China to establish civil society by starting with the following three aspects. One, support and help opposition movement of China. As present, not only many exiled overseas Chinese distant promote democracy, but also more people within China participated in opposition movement. The opposition movement itself is a part of civil society. And the outside world should support it. As a domestic opposition movement deems that extended support, uh, deems that external support may bring political risks, international support to the overseas democratic movement can become critical because the support will affect the domestic opposition movement. Two, support and help domestic NGOs are one of the important bases for civil society. As China is a large country, people's self-management will be all the more important. Therefore, training people's self-management ability through NGOs or similar organizations is important work in the establishment of a civil society. Social basis for NGOs has already been formed, especially in people's education, medical care, social support of minority groups, and environmental protections, etc. And these organizations need external support. Three, support and help public, public intellectuals. In China today, more and more intellectuals have started to participate in political life. They not only hope to act as leading forces, but also actively participate in many social activities, such as legal disputes and uh, grassroots elections. They are the vanguard of civil society.
and they can accelerate the construction of a civil society if they can obtain powerful support. So based on this, I hope to make three concrete suggestions. First is international non-government organizations for, and similar forces should promote the importance of establishing a civil society in China and lobby their government to pressure China's government and promote influential media to reinforce reports on these issues. Second, international non-government organizations and Western education institutions, universities like University of North Northwest should hold more seminars to discuss about China and ask Chinese distant and the common people to participate in these seminars so that their causes will be known to the world and the feedback to China as to increase their influence. Third, carry out leadership training program for people of domestic NGOs and the overseas democratic movement, providing them with democratic experiences of other countries and organizations operating knowledge. In order to achieve above objectives, as a representative of opposition movement overseas, we hope to become the bridge between China and the international communities, and to work together to help China in building its civil society. I strongly believe that this new Republic of China will be a good friend of the United States and a responsible member of international communities. And uh, I'm pretty sure that many among you will help us to give birth to this new China. I stop here. Thank you. We have about 15 minutes, just about a little bit less. Uh, we're on a tight schedule. So if you have questions, I'd ask you to limit yourself to one question only, which is difficult to do for academics, I know. Uh, but let's give it a shot anyway. Professor Sher will do the honors in direct traffic. I was very busy for the 20th anniversary activity, so I feel a little bit dizzy now. So if I who show bad off, forgive me. <laughs> uh, any questions? This is a good opportunity. Feel free to ask uh, any questions you may have. Oh, yeah. yeah. I was wondering if, if you could describe in a little bit more detail what you intend by civil society. Are there some specifics inside that phrase? I mean, what's the, what's the element of civil society in China today? Yeah. Well, I think there are several elements. You can see those uh, reporters. Like, a lot of the former participants of the 1989 movement, they are working in the media. They are always trying to, to, how to say, to pull, to pull some, to pull like. Uh, oh, oh, yeah. To, those those to, reporters to are some barriers, one, right? one element of civil society. And those lawyers, a lot of lawyers try to work with those disadvantaged groups, try to help, give, give, them, give, give them some legal support. And there are another element. And those public intellectuals, including those 305 intellectuals who signed the chapter 08, and they become more and more active. And I think they are the, another part of uh, civil society. Of course, we look forward more and more social forces can evolve in the establishment of a civil society, but at least these three elements become more and more visible. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. Uh, my question is connected to the last question, too. My question is, uh, what do you think of the jail of religion in contemporary China in building this civil society? For, for instance, we see like a lot of people who signed the, um, on chapter 08 are converted to, to Christians. And so like, what do you think of, think of the jail of Christianity and other religions? The religions? Uh, in building the civil society. So religions, of course, are very important for the, for the further of China, I think. Um, 
we have a big problem now is, is the low level of morality. I think religion can help this, can help to improve this situation. So I highly expect that religion can play more important role in the future social life. Christian is a very big influ influential now. I, I don't know the exact number, but a very big number. Of, and more and more young people start to, how to say it, start to convert it into Christian. And that's a hope, even though I'm not a Christian. Thank you. Um, uh, <clears throat> I've got a question about religion too. Because back in uh, the 70s and 60s, um, under the reign of Mao, like communism was like a religion too. And everyone sort of had this like freedom into this religion. And what do you think of that? Because that, that sounds like democratic to me. And uh, if there is a real election, I, I guess Mao would be elected too. Plus Hitler was elected. What do you think of um, democracy in that? Um, uh, uh, I think the problem is that the people of the country if the people of the country are very proud, if they have a democracy, they may choose some, like Mao Zedong or Hitler. In the history, in the, in the past history, I never say religion forces play a very important political role in, 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 in social life. So I, I don't expect that that will happen. If we have a free election, I don't think Hitler can be, no, not Hitler, I don't think uh, like Li Hongzhi can be elected as the chairman of China. I don't believe that. Back there, up there, sir. Oh, uh, Christoph, oh, it's over. Here's another question. Uh, how do you think of the prospect of having a democratic Tibet next to China? I mean, do you think this kind of partnership would really, I mean, help uh, uh, the democratic progress in China? Yeah, we, we not only have a problem like Tibet, we also have a problem like, like Xinjiang and, and Taiwan, but I think all this problem is not problem of Tibet or Xinjiang or Taiwan, it's a problem about the CCP, problem about the Because I think there must be have a democracy in China first, then we can have a platform to have the real dialogue if you want to resolve this problem, you have to know what's the real mainstream people's willingness. But without any democratic institutions, how do you know what's the real mainstream uh, uh, people's main willingness? Without that, well, I don't think that any dialogue is meaningless. Thank you. Uh, pretty much agree with you about the uh, development of NGO. However, I would like to ask you a question about the, the space of the uh, NGO de development in China. Uh, especially, they, they may have the cell census um, in China. Now, um, one sad thing, I just did a survey over southern China uh, with a long-standing NGO. And they were so afraid with the local government, uh, they may send some kinds of like Chinese FBI people follow up those students when they do the survey for just fellow worker in the factory. So, you know, even that kind of what in the Western country is a very minimal survey for like worker condition, that kind of thing in a, in a non-state, non-state firm. So, you know, even that kind of thing, you know, people would be so afraid about this at the moment of the time. How you think that the development of the NGO and the civil society later would be happen in three years? First of all, I think um, in a country like, like China, it always takes a long time to establish a civil society. I, don't, I think like 1989 is just the early start from establishment of a civil society. And you can presume it will take at least 23 or even 50 years. So now we, we start to have some NGOs. And uh, I admit the situation is really worse, really bad, but it's just a start, it takes time. I still have this belief for the future. It's better than nothing, at least the situation is better than 20 years ago. So we, we need to have, uh, have belief. Second, secondly, I think nowadays China, I think there, there are two Chinas. So one is the China in reality, 
Another is China on the internet. I think there's already a civil society on the internet already. Even me, myself, can have my own blog. Of course, use a fake name. But I draw a lot of heat. <laughs> Government cannot control all on the internet. And you can see the seed of civil society already existed on the internet. And that's the hope for further development. Thank you. Um, how far do you think China's economy is going to, is, can go without the backups of the political system? Well, this question beyond my, my ability. I'm not an economist. But I think uh, for the past 20 years, the only secret of government is use this rapid economic growth to cover all other social crises. So you can predict that if the economic growth slows down, those crises will reappear. And maybe there's one indication, I think, inflation rate maybe is very crucial for watching what will happen. Because in the history of a communist country, you can say it's always inflation happens first, then social turmoil happens following. Hi, thank you. Um, you mentioned that many scholars, are, or not many, but some scholars are starting to get involved in the political process. I wonder, uh, are, are lawyers getting involved in the process too? And I know that China recently is taking, is looking to other countries like America and Britain and Germany to develop its legal system when it writes new laws like the labor contract law or the uh, property rights law. So I wonder what role can the development of the legal world play in the development of the political democracy? I always think the lawyer, this group, should play the most important role in establishing a democratic country. Even in a democracy country, lawyers are important. All presidents are lawyers. This, this, this situation also happened in China. Uh, there are a lot of lawyers. First of all, about five years ago, ten years ago, they started to defend for dissident. It's a very new phenomenon. Never happened before. And uh, gradually, they go to countryside or they go to other disadvantaged groups, try to give them a legal system. I got the latest news about yesterday. Uh, the government tried to cancel the, the, how to say, the certification of lawyers. About 15 lawyers have been canceled their certification. So government already know the lawyer group become more and more powerful. Uh, thank you. Uh, I was just wondering, um, given the global recession that's happening right now, and um, there's been talks about um, a sort of Beijing model replacing the Washington consensus, I was just wondering what your thoughts are on that, and if you think there's currency there to that idea, what that means for uh, civil society in China. Thank you very much for the question. It's what I want to see. Nobody asked this question. I think so-called Beijing, I call it Beijing Pass, is a very unique phenomenon, and the Beijing development has has been through a very unique way. And this so-called Beijing Pass, I think based on some very evil values. The first evil value is in order to have a rapid economic growth or social stability, everything can be sacrificed, even including people's life. That related to dream force. Some people today, even some Chinese fellow, or even some Western people gradually accept this value that oh, you will want to have economy development, it's, it's right to kill so many people. This is an evil value. But Beijing has based on this, and gradually we didn't see a China gradually, uh, how to say, internationalization, but we see an international community gradually Chinese-nation. It's very dangerous. So well, we stand here to ask for attention to Dream Force, not only because Dream Force is what we did and we need a reassessment, because we need, because of the crackdown of Dream Force, there is something wrong about Chinese developed past, and we need, we hope we can have, in the future China, we can have a more healthy, and, and at least we need a past with more value and morality. Standing up, the gentleman standing up. Thank you. Um, I also have a question about the role of the economy in uh, democratization in China. Um, you mentioned before that inflation, rising inflation, could be 
a signal that um, there could be a democratic change in China. But do you think it's possible for the CCP to conduct more political reform and modernization under a successfully thriving economy? There have been some scholars, for example, that have written about how as peoples are developed, um, like the middle class in China, there'll be increased demand for political you know, sort of markets and democracy. Um, so what are your thoughts on that work? Well, as the normal social development theory, a large middle class can lead this society, or um, combined with uh, economic development, will naturally lead to democracy. It's, it's the old theory, but I don't think this theory can apply for the situation in China, because I don't think we really have a real middle class. So-called middle class today, we call it a new rich class. They are not the, the, the same middle class as the as, uh, middle class in the early history of uh, Western Europe. The middle class now in China, a lot of them are former uh, government officials. And another part, they have a lot of relationship with the state. They are not independent civil society forces. So I don't think this kind of so-called middle class will lead China or will give pressure to government, as a government to lead China to democracy. No, I don't think so. OK, last question. Uh, in the front. Yeah. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, you. You just now uh, you quote Max Weber, and you also said that uh, because of developments with economic development without political uh, kind of maturity will lead to a dangerous kind of foreign policy uh, disaster. For example, compare China with uh, Germany and Japan. Do you foresee or suggest that in the future China's foreign policy will become more and more aggressive if, it, if the economic uh, progress stalls? We already see that Chinese foreign policy become more and more aggressive, but not in a military way, of course, but in other ways, like a cultural ways. You can say so-called Kongzi Xue Yuan, Confucian institution, everywhere in the United States now. And I think the Chinese government used a lot of money and the means to promote so-called Beijing, so-called Beijing pass. This is a kind of aggressive foreign policies. So it's a, I think it's a new Cold War, actually. Okay, so the discussion will continue because we have two following panels, but we're going to take a 10-minute break right now. Wang Dan will still be here in the following two panels, and you guys can come up with more questions to ask in subsequent panels. Thank so you. Let us think. Thank you.